are not a researcher and you're here because you're interested in what it takes to create a coffee shop or a small boutique here in Sioux Falls, welcome. I am so happy you're here. This is still the place for you. My name is Beth Lambeth. I'm the Technology Transfer Officer at the University of South Dakota. And I am part of a National Institutes of Health grant called the SHARP Hub. The SHARP Hub, Zeal, Eval, and of course, SD Bio have been working together to put on this startup school workshop. Today, October 24th, is our very first workshop of the series. Thank you for starting us off on the workshop series, Matt. Matt Willard from the Funding Farm in Augustana University will be starting this out to tell us more about what investors do and do not want to hear. Today's workshop, I, I envision it to be a fireside chat type workshop. I definitely want to hear from you. We created more of a discussion than a PowerPoint, all because we want to hear what your questions are, and this is the perfect setting for you to ask those questions that normally you wouldn't be able to ask in maybe a traditional PowerPoint. After today, on October 31st, Halloween, next Thursday, we have Aaron Harmon with Quibbit, who will be speaking with us about navigating regulatory pathways. On November 5th, we have Dan James, who is a retired Yukon executive, and also someone who's very, very actively engaged with South Dakota startups. He will be speaking to us about creating a value proposition. Hello, welcome, please don't be shy, have some breakfast. <laughs> On November 21st, we have Tony Olson with D2 Consulting in North Sioux City to talk to us about intellectual property and how intellectual property plays a role in your business strategy. On December 5th, we have Gary Archambault with South Dakota Small Business Innovation, SBIR, <laughs> it just rolls off the tongue, SBIR, and Dan Ingebrigtsen with USD Biomedical Engineering Department speaking with us about how to fund a small business and of course, because it's startup school, more specifically how to fund a startup. And last but not least, on December 12th, we have Mark Slade with the South Dakota Small Business Development Center who will be speaking with us on how to create a business. So speaking of the U.S. Small Business Development Center and the U.S. SBA in general, I want to introduce Michelle, uh, who will very briefly talk to us about resources and how the U.S. SBA can help entrepreneurs and innovators in South Dakota. Michelle. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So we are located here in the Zeal building downstairs with our resource partners, the Small Business Development Center, our SCORE, SBIRs are there too. So, um, we have our loan programs, our counseling programs, and our contracting programs. And we just wanted to make you aware of them today. Um, I know some of you are already in business or not at the point where you need us, but we're here. So I'm just gonna pass on our resource guys if you have it. Um, you might uh, share with somebody else. But, um, <coughs> excuse me, allergies season for me. So uh, a lot of times um, we will get businesses coming in to sure if you want to. A lot of times we will get businesses that are just coming in and have no idea what they want. We'll, we try to get them to the right resource partner. We, we have our funding programs and also we have our contract programs. So if we can be of any assistance to you, if we can answer it, we will get you the right person. We work with the Governor's Office of Economic and Mental Development too. So we're a resource partner for you. We're here in the building. Please ask us questions. Let us know if you need something. Thank you. Thank you very much, Michelle. Uh, with that, I would like to have, I hope you don't mind if you introduce yourself. You have quite a background, but I'd love to hear more about Funding Farm and uh, your background in this topic. So uh, my name is Matthew Willard. I just recently started a new career. Um, as an assistant professor at Augustana in the business department down there. Um, I, I'm finding, I'm like, believe it or not, the tool or toy down there, so I'm teaching a whole variety of classes. But I'll be primarily focused on uh, entrepreneurship, small business management, and things like that. The funding farm is kind of a, uh, the last of a, of a kind of a weird career. Um, I actually started in project and business development working in 
satellite communication, satellite remote sensing. Back in the 1990s, um, I was involved uh, with these aircraft on the beginnings of what became US TV, and actually spent a lot of time in the 1990s working on what became uh, XM radio. Um, I found myself in a room after having written the first business plan on the 22nd floor of a hotel in New York with 22 lawyers editing word for word my business plan, and I realized that my work was done there. So I've been doing a lot in that area. I, I then um, also was heavily involved in uh, the utilization of GPS and agriculture for precision ag. Did a lot of work um, uh, really getting GPS into uh, the agricultural community. And actually that's what led me to Sioux Falls as I spent three years working with Raven and their agricultural uh, department or division doing precision ag and, and uh, introducing these products and things. So it's a pretty broad background. I was thinking about the biotech on the way over. I've not ever done anything in biotech. Um, but satellites are sort of have a characteristic which is similar, which is it takes a long time. And so one of the things we'll talk about today is that, that biotech investors have got to be patient because it just takes a long time to get something to market. Satellites are the same way. I mean, we started working on XM radio, what became XM radio in 1990, and I don't think it launched until 2000. So that's kind of an interest, interesting parallel. I, I, um, the funding farm started about 10 years ago uh, with a partner of mine who's a farmer, uh, has a group of farmers that made a lot of money in ethanol. And we decided uh, when they sold their ethanol plant that there was a need to uh, diversify their holdings. And we set up the funding farm, which is kind of an angel investment group, I think is the best way to put it. It's not venture capital. It's an early seed, it's an early stage uh, company that does uh, relatively small investments in real true startups. And we learned some interesting lessons doing that invested in four or five different projects, um, some of which have failed, a couple of which have flipped, and a couple of which are still percolating. Um, and so we have kind of the, the gambit. Um, my, my background is just from that brief description is pretty broad. Um, a lot of technology, um, we, we have uh, startup businesses that include things like coffee shops. So. I like small businesses, I like startups. Uh, I think the hardest thing in business, in this environment, when I say environment, startup, is starting. Uh, once you are started and you are cash flowing or making money, raising more money at that point is much easier. The hardest thing is right up front when you are have an idea on a napkin or you have your first prototype or you've got some something you're working on that you think is gonna work where do you come up with that very first $100,000 to begin with? Um, and by the way, that is not an easy answer. There's no, I do not have a magic bullet for you on that. So that's, that's my background. Um, I, I will say that when Beth asked me to uh, speak here, I don't view, as the professor, I guess, I don't view this as a one-shot deal um, for me. So if there's something that you're interested in working with me on or talking to me about, you can certainly have my availability. Um, I'll even pass out my cards if you like. You know, so don't feel like this is the only place you can ever talk to me. I'm happy to chat about stuff. I'm always good for a cup of coffee. So at a startup school, it doesn't sort of end at nine o'clock today. So. And you're located here. I am. I live in Brandon. Um, bunch of stuff, I guess, that, that, that I wish people would think about before they come. Um, one is kind of what I alluded to early on, which is you should know who you're talking to, who 
In other words, there are certain investors, like for example, my my investment group, all of my farmers in that group are 70 years old. And so for them to invest in a biotech company that's gonna maybe return money in 10 years is just not interesting. I mean, they just don't, they're not ready to do that. So, so do a little homework and know who you're talking to um, because you're gonna waste everybody's time if you're talking to the wrong investor. Another thing that, that I think is really important and, and these are not probably the things you would think about is, are you actually ready to give up part of your company? You know, that we, we get people that come to us and I've seen pitches where, you know, I want, I need $100,000 and when you ask the question, okay, what do I get? It's like a shot. And so you do a little homework before you make your presentation and, and your pitches. Am I actually ready to bring in a partner? Because once you take somebody else's money, you, 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 are, you have a partner. It's like getting married. And you know, it's, it's, a, it's a big deal to, to do that. And a lot of times people don't make that connection somehow, and, and there are ways to get money where you don't have to give up equity. That's the IR if you're in the right place. There are, the state has a $25,000 proof of concept grant. And so do some homework on that as well before you approach an investor and put a valuation on your company that's really high even though you haven't got anything yet. So those are a couple of things. The other thing that, and, and this is very much from my experience is what problem are you solving? Do you have, you know, you've got a widget or you got an idea, or you've got an app, whatever it is, why would somebody give you money for it? And we talked about the, pro about, I'm going to come listen because value proposition is a big deal. Not to you, but to the people that you want to give you money. And I try to break stuff down to really simple terms, which is why does anybody pay you for whatever it is that you're doing? So you need to know that value proposition going in. Um, and then I guess the last thing, and just to start the morning off a little snarky, is do you know what you don't know? I, I, and and I, I don't mean this to sound mean or whatever, but people who think they know everything about everything don't do well with most investors. And so when, whenever I listen to a pitch, one of the questions I ask is, where do you need help in your company? Basically, what do you not know? And if the answer is, oh, I got it all covered, that's like this red flag just went up. It's huge. It's like, oh my gosh. And so, so think about what you don't know, if you can. I always tell people it's really important to have a mirror. And what I mean by that is a, it's somebody you trust who will tell you the truth about what you're doing. We all have people we don't trust that'll tell us about what we're doing and we don't believe them. But find somebody who will say, you know what, you're not ready, or that's a, that's a great widget, you can get it patented, but nobody's ever gonna pay you for it. You have to be a little careful because some ideas, you know, just are, are the best ever. But I, I just, that, that's, a, that's a real um, kind of a red flag for me is, is I know everything none of us know everything. You will need help at some point in the process. So, yes. Question to, to build off that. So you mentioned that it's really a relationship between yeah. the investor and, and the person, person that you're investing with. But you go into more detail, does, does that mean monthly meetings, weekly calls, that the investor is going to say, this is how you have to do your research project. I mean, what does that mean? It really, so there, it really depends. And again, this is part of knowing your investor. So, in so what we have investments that we've made where I never talk to anybody. I, we sent the money over the transom, we get quarterly reports and we're hoping for the best. Um, we have projects where I'm in contact weekly with the guy running the project. Um, generally speaking, if things are going badly, you're gonna hear more. <laughs> um, so, but but it also it, it, again it, it, it it's it, it depends on the investor and their expectations. And it, as somebody approaching an investor, you should ask that question. 
what's required? Once I write cash your check, are you expecting monthly meetings? Are you gonna have a seat on my board? Are you gonna direct what I do? You know, and it's different if somebody is investing in an idea that's still in the lab versus, you know, investing in a company that's taking a prototype and then commercializing it. I mean, they're different stages. But that's a, that is a, you know, it's again, it's something you don't think about up front because you're so excited both to write the check, believe it or not, and to accept the money. Figure out the expectations first because I can tell you there are, I've got one of my entrepreneurs who I think wants to kill me because I call him all the time because things aren't going well and I want to know what he's doing with my money, not my money, but my group's money. And I, and I actually am bad about that. I, I, you know, I finally have to say, okay, I've, I've got to let this, this, you know, you've invested in this person. I'm going to let them do their thing. But, um, so it's, it's, it, it's not defined up front, so to say. I mean, it's, there, there's no um, set, there's no rule of thumb. It, it, and it depends on who they are and what their expectations are. A lot of times it depends on how much money they put in. My recommendation, though, to somebody who's asking for money is you want to know that now because you do not need another headache when you're trying to make your company work. So you feel like it's just as much the responsibility of the investor as the, the startup to really make a clear understanding of relationship and expectations. Yeah, and things. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I, I, can't, I would emphasize that is when you get an investor who says, yes, I'll write you a check, that's just the beginning. You know, you want to lay out what the terms are, what the expectation, not just, okay, you're going to get 10% of the company and 3% of the revenues and all the legal stuff. And, you know, you expect to talk to me every single day. You expect to have a quarterly review. Are you okay with an annual report? Right. And so getting that up front um, will make your life a lot easier. And also the investor as well, more comfortable. And then once you agree to it, do it. Well, nothing irritates me more than saying, okay, fine, just send me a quarterly report, we're good, and then I don't hear anything for eight, eight months. Usually when you don't hear anything, that's bad. That's a point for it. I, I definitely want to ask this question. What is the most important part of a pitch, and what are aspects of a great pitch? Is there a memorable pitch that you can think of that was just was amazing, and why was it so good? So I, so I, I actually get asked in the context of writing business plans and doing pitches, you know, what, what, what does an investor actually look at? And I think there are like three or four things. The first is in the first sentence or two, you need to communicate very clearly what it is your company does. If I have to read a business plan or listen to a pitch and I get into it five minutes or three slides and I still don't know what you're doing or what your company's doing, you've lost me. I mean, I'm, I'm just like checked out. And I think a lot of investors are that way. They, they wanna know, you know, my company built a widget that's gonna um, fix breast cancer. Oh, okay, now I know what you're doing. So be very clear early in what it is and capture that person's attention. We all, in this day and age, none of us have very good attention spans. And so you want to capture their attention quickly. The second thing that I look for is a lot of invest, you know, a lot of inventors, a lot of uh, people looking for money have a solution. I want to know what the problem is that they're solving. So very quickly get to that, which is okay. I've got this. Here's what my company is going to do. Here's the problem we're going to solve, and here's why our solution is a good solution, game breaking, whatever it is. And then the other thing that investors look at after you get their attention and you answer those questions, they go right to the numbers. They, they wanna look at your, your forecast, they wanna understand, and at the end of the day, they wanna make money. Most investors are not in it for philanthropy. There are some that are, but most of the investors that, that I work with, they wanna make money, so they're gonna go look at the numbers and see if they make any sense. And if the numbers are outrageous, you're gonna lose them there. So those, so those are some of the, the things that at least I look for right up front when I'm listening. What, what do you mean outrageous? Well, 
and so everybody liked, I can't, I'll, you know, everybody's seen the, I can't do it backwards, but, you know, the hockey stick. So in year one, I'm going to break even at a half a million in revenue, and in year two, I'm going to get 10 million in revenue, and life's going to be awesome. Nobody believes it. Now, one time in 10 million, that works, but nobody buys that. And, well, you know, back to your question, one of the things that everybody, it's going to take more money and longer than you think to get profitable. And so being realistic about how much revenue you're going to actually get, how soon you're going to actually be on the market, um, you know, being, being uh, I guess, again, objective about it and realistic is critical. Because the people that you're pitching to, and, and I don't put my, so I'm not a, I, I don't have my own personal fund. So I, I, I don't put myself in this category, but most people who have lots of money, some of them actually are pretty smart. And when they look at those, <laughs> when they, when, not all of them, but a lot of them. And so when they look at numbers that are cooked up like that, they're gonna just, they just, you lose them because it's not realistic. Um, I have never, ever been to a pitch where an investor said, you know, I think your revenue forecasts are low. I don't think I've ever heard that. And so, you know, if you, when you do your forecasts and your financials and you present these, you know, lovely numbers, you really need to be pretty cautious about what you show because people are paying attention. You know, they, and so that's what I mean. I mean, it, it, this idea that, you know, in year three, you're going to be, you know, 100 million customers and, you know, flipping the business. I mean, nobody buys that. So don't do it. Be realistic. The other thing is, if you don't know all the answers, that's okay. I, I mean, it's one thing you want to be confident, you want to, you know, be excited, but it's also okay when somebody asks a question to say, you know what, I'm not sure of the answer to that, because there'll be somebody in the audience who knows the answer, and if you don't tell the truth or if you say something that's not right, they won't say anything. But after you leave the room, they'll say, oh, he was full of crap on that one, so I don't. So that's what I mean by being realistic. I, I, I really, the other thing that I would emphasize is, unfortunately in this day and age, we're much more likely to watch a 90 second video than listen to a 20 minute presentation. If there is any way you can make a 90 second video that, that does all those, you know, captures people's attention, here's the solution to a problem, you know, I've done market, whatever it is, um, I tell you what, that, that'll, That'll capture a lot. Yes? Are you talking about a 90 second video video or a 90 second pitch? I'm talking about a, a video. I'm talking about, you know, welcome. Uh, I'd like to present my new project to you, and we're going to start. I'm going to just play a quick video so you can get a sense of what we're doing. Boom. Okay. I, I, I worked in television, so I know how to do videos. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, again, it's, 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 on the one hand, you could say it's kind of a shame. Because again, our attention spans are short. But the reality is, everybody will watch a 90 second video. Not everybody will read a 20 page business. I mean, I can tell you, most people won't read a 20 page business plan. And that's a, a, a just another, you know, people ask, so I teach writing business plans. That's one, I'm doing it right now. And it's like, why do I have to write a business plan? The venture capitalist in Silicon Valley says you don't need one, you just need one page. And, and, I, and, I, and the answer to that is the business plan is for two things. One, if you do it seriously, it should give you an idea of whether what you have is real and whether you think it actually will work. And so it's as much for you as anything else. The second piece of it is that, that that's what due diligence is about. So once you capture my attention and get me excited about an idea, I'm gonna wanna read the business plan because I wanna see that you've done your homework and know how the thing's going to operate, you know, how you're going to manufacture, you know, who's your partner, all those things that, that are should be in the business plan really, to me, are part of the due diligence process once you capture somebody's attention. Is there a website where one can go to to find out what a business plan needs to have in it? There are thousands. I mean, it doesn't make a difference. It's like this. <laughs> um, I, I, I don't have one off the top of my head, but there are thousands of Literally, if you Google how to write a business plan, it's 
I'm, I'm happy. Can I have my kids' keyword bonus? Yes, yes, ma'am. Yeah. <laughs> I can I can find you one. I mean, I use a very simple book. There's not, again, it's not a lot of magic. It's just make sure you cover it. So you make things clear. Yeah. I'll just quickly interject. That would be something the SBDC would have as a business. Of course. Yeah. Okay, and I can so. Yeah, so, yeah so, so, so that's, sorry, that's actually a great point. So you don't have to hire somebody like me to help you with a business plan. You can. I, I write it for people all the time. But, you know, you have a lot of free resources at Thiel. Somebody can sit down and walk you through that. I mean, I'll do it. Small business office has uh, resources um, and templates on their website. In fact, so I thank you. That's a great point. And so there's there's a lot of free resource for that sort of stuff. But again, remember that the business plan is as much for you mm -hmm. as it is, you know. And it, and it's important because you know it's like okay, so I know look, I've got I know I can make this thing, and I actually found the company that will manufacture it. I think I can market it, but what about the IP? Have you looked at the intellectual property part of this thing, right? Oh, I gotta check that box, I better think about that. I'm gonna need to hire 26 people in uh, Madison, South Dakota to do this, because that's where I wanna live. There are 26 people in Madison looking for jobs right now. How am I gonna handle the labor situation? I mean, those are real questions that would normally be addressed in a business plan that you should be thinking about. So the business plan is mainly to train our brain as to what we're doing? It, it's really to vet what you're doing. To, okay. to objectively determine, is this really gonna work? Because one of the absolute greatest outcomes of writing a business plan is that it's a bad idea and I'm not gonna do it. Because think about how much time and money you save by not pursuing something stupid. And, and I don't mean stupid in the idea, I mean stupid from a business standpoint. I mean, I tell people that all the time. When they get upset, they say, oh, this business plan, it just doesn't look like it's gonna work. And I said, thank God we found out now. Mm -hmm. I've had clients, I mean, literally pay me ten, twenty thousand dollars $20,000 to write a business plan, and they get upset with me that that's the outcome. And I'm like, you, I said, that's the best $10,000 you've ever spent, because your startup costs are 400. Imagine how mad your dad would be if he gave you $400,000. Anyway, sorry, but that's that's the and, and and people will an investor. I mean, I, not all, but I will read a business plan after I'm interested in something because I want to see. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I I'm not taking questions from you, I see. Sorry. <laughs> I tend to look at them a little before I'm ready to write the check, but but it's much more part of the due diligence process than it is part of the getting my attention process. It, it, that, yeah. yeah. So, 
you so, want the 90 second video to get your attention and right. then pitch and then follow on discussions. Right, let me, I'll give you, let me give you an, an example of a company. So we invested in, and it's a company that writes um, software, it basically writes curriculum for STEM, science, technology, engineering, math. This guy out of Minnesota comes down here, actually in this room, and he's pitching us a company called STEM Fuse, and his gimmick is to teach kid. and this is seven years ago, is to teach kids how to do computer programming by having them build um, computer games, right? So he happened to connect with the right guy, because I have a kid who's at that time 11 years old and is playing a lot of games, he likes computers, and I'm a teacher. And I got, he didn't do a video, but he did you know, a two minute, three minute overview, and I said, that's a good idea, that'll work. If we're trying to write STEM curriculum for kids and you, you have them learning to write computer programs by building video games and mobile phone apps, that, that idea, I think, that I, I think that's a good idea. And he had built a class and he had got it into 12 schools and there was a lot of good stuff around. 90 seconds into it or three minutes into it, I'm, I'm sitting at the table going, man, I get that. Because teaching is all about keeping people's attention. 95% of teaching is just keeping their attention, particularly at 8 in the morning. And, and the students end up with actually an object at the end of the exercise mm -hmm. so, that functions. Yeah, yeah so, so then we went into the whole business plan, due diligence, all that other stuff. And that company, and that's a good example of took more money and longer time. Seven years later, he's profitable. Seven years into it, because we were a little ahead of the curve, actually. So anyway, that's a good example. And it wasn't a great pitch, by the way, but we got there. So. <laughs> Are there any other questions before we get into more of my questions? Okay. I, I, mm -hmm. I want to add one other thing that I can't emphasize enough. Don't be an asshole when you're doing your presentation. Don't be a jerk. Oh, that sounds tough. <laughs> it is for some people. It's strange. We had a, we had a pitch uh, that I loved. It was a company that was building a, a way that you could um, convert a diesel truck engine to run on natural gas. This was five or seven years ago. And these guys were such jerks, we kicked them out of our office. I mean, I loved what they were doing. And I, I didn't... I hadn't done all my due diligence yet. I hadn't, you know, looked into making sure that their patents were real. I just liked the idea. Natural gas is three dollars a BTU, and a BT. anyway, it was cheap. But they were jerks, and they treated us like jerks. And it's like, you know what? I don't do this very often, but I have a PhD from Stanford. I'm not stupid. Don't treat me like I'm stupid. I never any nobody you, you none of you know. I never do that. <laughs> the point is, is that you want people to like you. They're writing you a check. Be nice. Tell a joke. Be friendly. You know, don't don't just be a jerk and arrogant. Because one of the things we're looking for is somebody we can relate to, that we can coach, that we can and, and even if you're not coachable, pretend like you are. <laughs> and and I, I I mean I, again it's a relationship at some level, particularly during the process of asking for money. Once you have the money, you, you know, you may be, depending on what the expectations are, you may be on your own. But, you know, you're, you're going to build it. And the thing you're going to have to do at some point in the process, almost invariably, is go back and ask for more. If they don't like you, you're probably going to have a tough time. And, and, and I know that seems kind of, you know, you, you know, well, we're in business. It's just business. It is never just business. I get so tired of when people say, well, it's just business. It's all about the relationships and if people like you they're more likely to want to do business with you it's just a fact of life anyway that's a you know back to the you know what do i look for i mean i actually don't really want to do business with somebody i don't like and when i was younger it was okay now i just don't have that interest go ahead uh, showing vulnerability versus a lack of confidence there's a fine line there can you comment on how we see it is a fine line um, and, I, and this is a personal
personal, I mean, this is me, and I can't speak for other investors. You know, I like people who are confident. I want people who are excited about what they're doing and, and know about what they're doing. Um, you know, I'd much rather have somebody be, when I ask them a question, or if there's some piece of the puzzle that they haven't finished or they don't know yet, like, I don't know whether I can get a patent. I'd rather have them be upfront about it and then talk about, okay, here's what I'm thinking about in terms of um, filling that gap. Or, you know, I really don't, I really haven't thought about that. What do you think I should do? I mean, again, you're kind of suckering them in a little bit at that point. But, you know, the vulnerability thing, I mean, that, I know there are people, and again, I'm not a typical venture capitalist, but I know there are investors who will shred people because their ego's involved and that's what they think their job is. And my guess, you know, being vulnerable to them may be a negative. To me, it's more of a, I, you, you have a sense of what you don't know. So I like that, but that's, again, that's a real, that's a personal thing. I mean, and, and part of it too is when you're looking for money, I mean, when somebody finally says yes, you almost want to say, okay, I don't care about anything else. I just want the check because I'm excited. But if you have somebody who's going to be um, antagonistic or whatever when you're vulnerable, you, you might want to think about how much you want their money. And I just, it, that, again, that, that's personal. That's not industry, you know, that's not industry standard response. I, it's a tough question, though. Yeah. I think it goes back to your earlier point. Yes. So you can come across as quotable, that's quotable, that's different than being yeah. you have to show a lack of confidence. Right? And that's I think the difference for really Yeah, when you when you're when you're on ground that you're familiar with and you know, don't back off. If somebody challenges you, I so I, I've been in meetings where I've I've been the pitchy pitcher, pitch I'm I'm making the pitch and somebody will challenge me on something I'm pretty confident about and you know there's a tendency again you're trying to get them to give you well yeah maybe maybe I, I you go ahead and stand your ground if you're confident about your your point um, and, and to your point I mean it's I think that's right is if you and that's why I would say turn it back on them say you know I haven't really thought about that you know how would I get a market test you know or I need a good patent attorney. Do you know one? I mean, those are the kinds of things that I think are perfectly reasonable and, again, indicate coachability. And do people like that that you go to Europe supposed to be asking for advice? <laughs> <laughs> Seriously? <laughs> right? So there, there's actually a saying that works pretty well. It's if you want advice, ask for money. If you want money, ask for advice. Right? Because if you if you ask for money, you know, obviously if you're going in to pitch for money, you should know. But if you're cold approaching somebody or relatively cold, if they know you're coming in for money, and even if it's an official pitch, they're going to be looking for any reason to say no. Okay. But if you come in and you're like, I've got this really great idea, but I need help with this part, if you get them hooked into it, then you might find them asking you how much you need after it. You know, I, I don't watch it anymore because I got I don't really like it the Shark Tank. But if you watch, if you think about a lot of those pitches where the sharks are sitting there and they start to compete for the for the deal, it's well I can bring you a distribution network or I can bring you marketing or I know how to do licensing. And so the point is a good one, which is part of I don't want to say you're pandering to their expertise, but you know. People who have money are still human. <laughs> that was supposed to be a joke. Um, but, uh, but, and so, you know, asking for um, advice in that context might seem a little weird. Now, if you've got everything nailed down and you've got all the pieces in place and you've got it pretty well, I mean, it's sort of like going for a job interview. You know they're going to ask you in a job interview, well, what's your biggest weakness, right? I hate that question, by the way. They always ask it, and you should be prepared. Have an answer. You can get your kids to Google what questions is an investor going to ask me, and 
and I'm sure I'm sure there's a hundred of them that, that are just sort of in there. And we could, I mean, in fact, as a follow-up at some point, I mean, that could be the kind of thing where, you know, in a startup class, if you want, we could go through and say, here's here's traditionally what you get asked. And it, it's going to be different because different investors have different emphasis or, or something like and that. And it's probably very different for each technology too. I'm, I'm, I'm guessing. Yeah. Or oh yeah. Every, every project is different. I mean, again, and, and I, I use the example of the biotech because I I have this image of guys in a lab over here doing beakers and stuff that's ten years away from anything versus you know somebody who has a, a prototype and a patent and seven customers already. I mean, those are totally different things. I know we touched on this just a little bit uh, of what investors really don't want to hear. Don't be an asshole. Don't yeah, have ridiculous yeah. projections. Yeah. Uh, do you have any other ideas for us on, on what yeah. they don't want to hear? Never say this is a no-brainer. <laughs> do not ever say to an investor, this is a no-brainer idea. And the other, the other one that I would, again, it's kind of knowing what you don't know. Um, one of the things that I always focus on is who's your competition? And if the answer is, well, we don't have any, again, huge red flag. You always have competition. You may not know it, but find out. And even if there isn't somebody who's directly competitive, there are people who are indirectly competitive. And if there's nobody indirectly competitive, think about who's going to put you out of business once you're successful. Because the one thing I can guarantee you in business is that if you do something that works, somebody will copy it. I mean, I can almost guarantee that. <coughs> and if that person who copies it is 5,000 times your size, that could be problematic, right? So, so the no competition thing, no brainer, um, I got it all covered, I don't need any help, just write me a check. Those are some things, again, you might get a different answer from a different investor, obviously, but those are things that, that really raise red flags for me. Um, don't be arrogant, you know, I mean, don't, I mean, I mean be confident, but don't, don't be a jerk. Um, you know, when I coach people to do pitches, I always try to, you know, be personable. You know, even before the meeting, like you and I were talking, my house flooded and I didn't sleep last night because the tape is wet. I mean, you want to connect with people, with, and even though they're uh, sitting there and they're formidable and they're rich and you know, you're looking to get have them give you money. So, but those are those are a couple of things that just set me on edge right away. And when I say set me on edge, I, I, mean, I don't get upset about it. It just makes me go, hmm, I don't, you know, that doesn't sound good. And never say this is a no brainer. Never. <laughs> One other thing I want. I was really referring if you hand somebody a 20 page business plan that's what they're going to do they're, they're they're not in, in terms of the pitch if I if you've got my attention I want to hear the rest of it so if it's a 10 minute or 15 minute uh, presentation what I'm saying is that if in in the in the verbal or the video or whatever you got to get people's attention right up front and then go through the rest of it in the written document what my point was is that you have to do that right up front. An investor reading that is very likely to then skip to the numbers. In, in the presentation itself, presentation of the numbers is always tricky because um, you want to you want to show that you have a realistic um, forecast and a realistic idea of how long this is going to take and how much money it's going to take. The, the challenge is that and again, I speak for myself, is when I look at those numbers in a presentation, they're sort of, I don't really take them that seriously until I can look at the details, and that's in the written stuff. So I want to see that you've got a plan, but then I'm going to, I mean, when, I, when I'm looking at something seriously, I actually look pretty hard, and I'll probably ask you for your spreadsheet and your assumptions, because I'm doing, at that point, it's due diligence. I'll be honest, when you first said that the investor goes straight for the data, my brain 
brain uh, thinking about biomed technologies went straight to STEM, right? I was thinking you were going to say we want to achieve efficacy, we want to achieve some validation. How is it in oh. cell culture? How about the animal model? Sure. Are, are you looking for, let's show a bar chart of uh, the decomposition of this drug in the bloodstream, your method versus this other method. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. What other types in, of in, data? Yeah, in a presentation, that sort of stuff is great. Once you've got their attention, you know, when I talk about the problem and the solution, you know, the solution, once you say, oh, I have a solution, then, and again, I'm not a, an expert in the biotech stuff, but then if you can show, you know, this is how our drug works, and here's what our data shows, here's what the competition does and what it shows, and the more you can do it in a visual picture, literally, rather than in words and bullet points, bullet points are okay, but if you can show it in a graph or a chart, something that, that lays out the data that you do have that shows how you're different. Because once you, once you just get my attention or get somebody's attention, once you say, I can solve this problem and here's my solution, what's the next question? Well, if you can solve it, how, who else can solve it? And how are they doing it? Are you faster, better, cheaper, whatever is your competitive advantage? Value proposition and competitive advantage are gonna be critical because if your competitive advantage has got about six months of life, that's not good enough. And so, so yes, the answer is when, when, when I talk about the financials, that's, that's something that they will look at in the, in the written document. In the presentation, if you have data, if you've done real market research, if you've done real prototype testing, and you have results, show them. I, before we got here, you were talking about your biologics, and if you can, you know, I, I, sorry, I know a little bit about it, so I'm kind of dangerous, but if you, you know, there's, there's lots of companies doing biologics right now, lots of them. Well, if you actually have one that works, and you demonstrated it in the field, show that data all day long, because when I'm sitting there listening to somebody say, well, if you use my whatever it is, it's gonna increase the root mass and you know, you're gonna get better day, you know, better um, yield. Like, that's snoopy at this point. But when you say, what did you tell me on corn, 30 bushels an acre more, whatever the number was, and I can look up the competition because he has a chart that shows, you know, this company does 20, this company does 10, this one's never been in the field. And they all have great presentations and beautiful pictures of roots and all that <coughs> stuff. Ours works in the field, and that, by the way, is the farmers, three farmers who will tell you that it works. Okay, now I'm excited. So now you've combined both the technology and the customer. Right. And my question was gonna be, in the pitch, a lot of my clients spend way too much time talking about their technology, because that's what they oh, were yeah. really involved with sure. developing. What do you wanna hear about in the pitch? Is it? Oh, I customer wanna, market is it? Oh yeah. My pathway to the customer. Yeah. So so when I talk about the solution to a pro when I talk about the problem, that's the customer. Okay. I mean indirectly, but absolutely. I mean, and again, it depends on you know if you're doing lab R and D and you don't know yet who the customer is. Yeah, maybe. If you can't tell me who the customer is and why they're interested, I'm probably not going to. So the you know I always I always ex when I'm teaching business planning and pitching it's it's always you, what you're trying to do is reduce the perceived risk of the investor reduce the perceived risk of the investor so if I say to you I got this great idea and there's 10 million people out there who would love it eh, okay I've done a market survey and. You know, I surveyed a thousand people and 70% of them said they'd buy it. Oh, okay. If I gave out 10 of these things in a prototype and I can't get them back, that's good. I sold 20 of them. Okay, that's even better. You've reduced the perceived risk. So the more information you have about your target market and the customer and what you've done with them, the better. Again, I'll just pick on you for a second, but I've had people pitch me biologics, and it's like, well, how many farmers are using it? Well, it's great in the lab. Okay, that, that's okay. I've got, how many farmers have you got using it? 80,000 acres. 80,000 acres. Okay. That's kind of, 
actually, I mean, in corn and soybean world, that's not a, actually that many acres, but that's a hell of a lot more than zero. And so it, it says, okay, I get it. That's early adopters, that's sporting people, that's all good. You've reduced my perceived risk a ton. And following up on that perceived risk, that is going to increase the level of equity. If, if I ask you for a million dollars and there's a huge risk, right. you're going to want most of my company. Right. Yeah. No. So but if there's almost no risk, right. I mean, or, or a reduced risk. Yeah. So no. can you talk a little bit about how does your company come in? Uh, you know, what level of equity would you want in a in a deal? It kind of depends on the <laughs> right? <laughs> actually, actually, that's not right. We don't want it all. And the reason we don't want it all is we want the guy running it, the person running it, to be incentivized. You can disincentivize the inventor or the, the entrepreneur if you take too much. It's actually an interesting dynamic, uh, which I've run into, where I've had somebody say to me, well, I don't really care anymore. I only own 14% of this mess. Anyway, so so, but but that is that is becomes part of the negotiation almost, which is. Well, I'll give you an example. I, I did a project um, uh, with, uh, that I really liked um, with somebody who wanted who was building a telemedicine platform independent of all the the big players and, and had this idea to market it to uh, rural facilities basically. And it was good. I had a good project. Pretty good little you know, system that he built, and we got to the end of the business plan, which he paid me to write for him. And I was getting ready to take it to my investor group, and he says to me, "I said, well, how much? We need about a million or a million five. You know, what? What's the deal?" And he says, "Well, I want. Uh, I'll sell five percent of the company for a million bucks." And I looked at him and I said. If you can find somebody to do that, take the money and run. You've just put a $20 million valuation on a pre-revenue company. There may be somebody out there in Silicon Valley who would do it. It ain't me. So, so, so that's that's sort of one end of the spectrum, right? I would. I told him. I said honestly, um, given where you are, a million dollars, I I'd expect to get 50 plus percent of the company. And then I said to him, I said, if you get this thing into 10 hospitals start showing revenue and they're making money, um, I'd take 10%. Now, I, again, uh, those are just scatterbrained numbers right now, but that's that's the point. If you come with a, hey, I've made it work in the lab and you know there's some stuff in a beaker over here that's pretty cool and we'll do some neat things, I'm gonna want a lot of your company if, I, if I'm willing to do anything. If you've done clinical trials and there's people using it and it's working, then you can sell, then that negotiation becomes much different. And so part of part of reducing the perceived risk of the investor also allows you to keep more of the company. Um, along with that, reducing the perceived risk for the investor as much as you possibly can so that it's a no-brainer. Just joking, <laughs> I'm just joking. Um, it seems like there's a bit of a rock in a hard place, right? So you've got something that works really well in the lab, super excited about this, but validating your claims will take a little while. Mm -hmm. Do you have any advice for someone who has really tried discovery, but it's going to take, honestly, maybe 30 grand in 12 months to have data to prove the claims? Yeah, so this is the, this is the, this is in fact the worst thing in the world from, from the startup perspective. And that's why Gary and the SBIR exist. That's why the state's $25,000 proof of concept exists and there are other, other programs out there, right? That is, that is the hardest place to be because venture capital, I, I, this is not a um, secret really, but venture capitalists really don't do startups. Uh, if you want seed funding, that first $50,000, Venture capitalists in Silicon Valley is probably not, they're, they're interested in stuff that's already going that they can grow from a million to a hundred million, mostly. There are a few that'll look at seed, but not very many. And so that's, that's, a, that's a trick. 
um, friends and family, angel investors, um, F, you know, an SBIR process or some sort of state grant or find somebody who's willing to sponsor it. Sometimes you can find a customer who's willing to say, I believe in it enough, I want to see if it works and I'll, I'll partner with you in some fashion. But that's a, I, I, again, I wish I had a magic bullet for you. There are some smaller funds that are specifically targeted at seed projects, but boy, that's a tough place to be. And it, I, I don't, again, I wish I had a, a simple answer for you, but that first 50 to 100 grand that you have to raise outside of your family and friends probably is the hardest money you have to get. It's way easier if you're making, a, if you're doing a million a year or two million a year in, in revenue and you're breaking even or a little profitable, it's way easier to raise money at that point. Because way more people are interested. Any, I see you smiling, you gotta. I, I, well, it, it's like anything else. It's easier to bankroll when you've got people. Of course, yeah. yeah. <laughs> So, so I, have a, I have a project right now that I think is the best project I've got. And it's a guy who has figured out how to basically turn every single one of us into an influencer by monetizing texting or messaging. I'm doing <laughs> so, so, and, and he's, he's got all, anyway, it's a long, but, but he, so we're out raising money. And exact, it's exactly what they said. And this guy has been doing this. He's actually got revenue. And, there, and the answer is, well, when you get your first big mobile phone company signed up, then we'll invest. And the answer was, well, when that happens, we don't need you. And so, this, and again, it's, it, I, I don't want to make light of this, because this is exactly it's the valley of death, or it's whatever you want to call it. And when we talk about the entrepreneurial community in Sioux Falls and around, it's like, what do we need? We need that. Somebody could do that somehow. But the problem is that those are also the riskiest projects. And so it takes a special investor with a special appetite that says, okay, I'll give you that first 100 and I'll only take 35% of your company, whatever, 50 if we're negotiating now. And start high. <laughs> start high, yeah, I want, I want enough. And knowing that a lot of those are just gonna fail. I mean, a lot of them. You know, you hear that in Silicon Valley, and I, I've never subscribed to it, which is one reason I'm probably not going to, I mean, I'm not going to ever be rich, is that, you know, they hit, they'll fund 20, and they'll tell you, well, I, I need two to break even and one home run, and I'm good. In my world, if I did that, I would, people would, I'd be strung up. And so when I, when my group invests, I mean, we failed a few times, but I want all of them to succeed. And so I get too invested. I mean, not money-wise, but emotionally and, and working hard. Like, we got it. We got to make this work. But it's it's that's a really tough. That's a, that is a difficult thing. What I would suggest is that before you give up or before you continue to go back to friends and family, is talk to the like the small business development center. Talk to Jerry about SBR. Talk to people like me. Is it a good fit? If it only takes one sort of angel investor, so take it, I'll give you another example. One of my clients is a lady up in Minneapolis who runs a totally unique company. Basically, they do something called accessibility testing for um, websites. And the idea is that you make them accessible to people with disabilities, okay? And there's a whole lot of people doing it. Her competitive advantage is she only hires people with disabilities to do the testing. Right? It makes all the sense in the world if you think about it. If you're trying to make sure that your website's good for a blind person, having me test it is stupid. I'm not blind. Having a blind person test it will get you the real answer. And so she's, I can't remember where I, what, where I was going, but she, she is trying to raise a little money. And Oh, sorry. And nobody will talk to her. because She only does about 300000 a year. She's, pretty, you know, she's a little profitable. It's too small. We're looking for that foundation or that angel investor, and this is gonna sound terrible, whose kids are disabled. Mm. Yeah. Because that person, just like I was with STEM, they'll get it immediately. Now it turns out that the disabled population is growing. 
people like me are getting older and, and we're becoming disabled if we weren't already. Um, and, and so it's a huge market and it's also a huge uh, pool of people who can work that are underemployed. And right now there's not a lot of pools of people in this country that are underemployed. So, but it's that kind of thing where you go, okay, we, she and I were talking about this yesterday and I said, we, we've got to quit screwing around with banks and other, we just need to find that one angel investor whose son is disabled or her daughter is blind or they have some mental health issues because that's the person who will get it and we can make them a little money along the way. Not easy. I mean, we, we, haven't, <laughs> we haven't done it yet, so. Well, we have got about five, ten minutes left. Are there any other questions? Or I still have some. <laughs> Are there any questions you guys have? There, there's, yes. I have a question for you. It's, it's mentioned earlier on. The only question I'd like to ask is where do you need help? And it sounds like that you're actively working with some immigrant companies. So how common is that individual family investment in the world to get somebody that's going to kind of partner with you to help you? What kind of services can you expect them to help you with? You know, that's a great question. I've concluded after doing this and you know, funding farms been around about eight years and we've, we've done five or six investments, I've concluded there's really only two ways to do this from my standpoint is I either have to give the money to you and hope for the best and I don't want to know what's going on so they just send me reports or I have to be way more involved. Not, maybe not me personally, but somebody on my team has to be like COO or something. And so it just, it, again, it really depends on the investor. Um, and, and that's part of, I think, getting the right investor and actually vetting your investor a little bit to know. And so when you call me up and say, you know what, um, I'm struggling, I need to figure out a new marketing plan or I need to patent something, you know, what am I gonna get? Now, most investors will go, well, you know, call my lawyer, you know, I'm just a patent guy and stuff. But somebody who's actually gonna sit down and really work through stuff with you. I mean, that, again, I think it's a lot That's of that. worth a lot. <laughs> it's worth a lot, but it's also something that is largely dependent on who gives you the money. Um, so, again, it, there's a little bit of, there's a little bit of a fine balance there between, um, you know, I want you there when I want you there and I need help, but I don't really want you micromanaging my company. And so, I tend to be, I mean, personally in my group, I tend to be pretty involved if you need me. I also have to train myself to say, okay, I helped a lot, now I'm, I'm ready to back out again and let me know when you need help. Yeah, I, yeah. So <clears throat> from the other side of the table, the data shows that angel investors are actually the highest performing asset class out there dictating about three conditions. One is that they have to invest in at least 10 to 12 companies to get a portfolio, right? Two is they invest in an area where they have some level of personal expertise. Four, something in their group, right? And three is they do both active due diligence and follow-up and are actively involved with the company. So, so active involvement is actually a significant part of making those high returns. He, he, already said he doesn't want any of his companies to fail he's going to do what he can to make sure it, it, and that may mean a lot of involvement there, there's so another to step completely back because if everything looks like it's going really well yeah there, there's another there's another aspect to that and and i think anybody who's looking for money you need to understand that if you think you need three hundred thousand, you probably need a million and, and so you're gonna you are gonna go back i can only again one of those axioms, I can almost guarantee whoever you got the money from, you're gonna probably go back for more. And so if they're invested emotionally, if they're you know involved with the project, it's a lot easier to get more than if they're disassociated and they just go, this sucks, I'm just gonna write it off. So, so again, it's a balance. Um, I, I've actually, in a couple of my projects, micromanaged them because they were failing, and, th and then that didn't work very well either. So, I mean, it's a balance. 
I, if I was looking for money at this point on an idea, I would err on the side of somebody who was going to be involved, who did want to know what was going on, who would offer me help, but also wasn't going to be staring over my shoulder every single minute of the day. That's, again, it's a, it's a balance. That didn't answer your question very well. So another, another thing to think about, I know we're running out of time, but everybody thinks that they want to get equity. You know, you may be able to find investors who are very happy with convertible debt, you know, some, a different tool. Because, and debt, I know everybody hates debt, and my wife hates debt. I mean, she won't let me take out a credit card. So, but debt is not terrible. You gotta be careful with it, but, but you don't give up equity. And so, if, you know, there are, I mean, there are different tools that you can use, potentially. It's always easier, like I said, though, you're not going to get any debt early unless you sign away your house, your kids, and whatever land you have, and personal guarantees, because they will collect on you. And your virtual land. And your virtual, well, yeah, but we, you can have mine. <laughs> <laughs> He's a teenager, so. <laughs> This is a this is one of the myths of uh, building companies is that the best way to get good employees cheap is to give them equity. A lot of employees don't really care about equity; they want money. And so, offer them a percent of revenues. You know, give them some sort of incentive different from equity. Um, some people are again, it, it's you know, people are people. Some people are motivated by equity. Um, I've tried that in companies where we did sort of a quasi ESOP, and the the young the young it was a young group of employees, and it didn't work at all because they just didn't they weren't invested in the idea that this was going to be worth something in five years. They wanted money now. So you know if you if you're trying to hire somebody like me, you know who's maybe uh, a little more settled economically, yeah, equity might not be bad, but. But there are other ways to incentivize people, and, and I think the focus on just equity is not good. You want to you want to think about you know, percentage of revenues or incentive. You know, if you're hiring software people, software people are notorious for kind of working at their own pace. So you know, put in place incentives for getting stuff done, and make sure it's tested when they release it. By the way, um, and things like that. Well, I want to be sure to end on the time so that everyone can get to whatever meetings they have throughout the rest of the day. Uh, that said, can you stick around for a little bit oh, just yeah. in case people do have some more questions? Please join me in very much thanking you for this session. Thank you. Yeah, please come to our next one. It's uh, next week, Halloween, about navigating regulatory pathways. We, I would love to see you. And please grab some breakfast on your way home. Lots of coffee and sandwiches. Thank you very much for coming. <laughs>